The annual Ruckman Dinner Lecture Series is made possible by an endowment from alumnus Jerry E. Ruckman, a 1962 Bachelor of Science in Physics, now retired from IBM. Each year, the department invites physics and astronomy teachers in the area to join us for dinner with our faculty and a special department colloquium presented by a nationally recognized figure in science education. The intention of this event is to help keep us informed about physics education in our high schools and area teachers informed of the university and departmental resources and research opportunities available to them. Our guest tonight is Brian Thomas, who comes to us from Washburn University in Topeka, where he is associate professor in the Department of Physics and Astronomy. Uh, Brian did his undergraduate work at the University of the Pacific, I'm sorry, University of the Pacific, his master's and PhD work at the University of Kansas. Uh, Brian's been working especially hard recently on a project entitled Astrophysical Ionizing Photon Events and Primary Productivity of Earth's Ocean, which is a half million dollar NASA grant. This project is studying the effects of marine phytoplankton plankton, if Earth were to receive a blast of radiation from an event such as a supernova or gamma ray burst. Tonight, Brian will look at these dangers and others in his presentation entitled, Our Dangerous Universe. Please welcome Dr. Brian Thomas. Thanks for coming. So my job tonight is to inform and frighten you. Uh, so if you don't leave frightened, then you can have your money back. Uh, in case you're wondering, because uh, Dr. Lee asked me about this earlier, who's this guy right here? This is the mascot of Washburn University, Ichabod Washburn, and now you know. Probably the most studious uh, mascot I've ever seen at any university yet. So you know we know what we're doing. Uh, I should point out a couple of things here. One, this is an artist interpretation. Don't take this too literally. I'll talk a little bit about what we might actually expect in a little while, and it doesn't involve the atmosphere lighting on fire, in case you are worried. Uh, this, however, is a real picture, although the Earth is not really this close to the sun, fortunately. The size is about right. Uh, this thing right here is a coronal mass ejection, and I'll talk more about this in a little while, and this should scare you. Alright, so I want to start with a little description of our place in the universe. Some of you may be familiar with this, some of you may never have really seen much of it before. And I want to start with this because it's important to understand just how big the universe is when we're talking about the kinds of rare events that I'll be talking about, but which are not so rare if we consider the whole universe or even our sort of local environment. So I'll say more about the rates of that kind of thing later. But to start out, everybody probably knows we live on a planet. Most of us accept that it's spherical, and most of us accept that it orbits around a star. Uh, that star is much larger than our planet. Pretty much everyone knows that, of course. Uh, what some people tend to get confused is the solar system versus the galaxy. So by the time you leave tonight, you should know that the solar system is our sun and some planets and a bunch of other junk. And the galaxy is a collection of much more than that. So not only our solar system, but some 400 billion other stars, and lots and lots of planets, and things like that. So, if you can keep those two separate, then you're right, off to a good start. Uh, the galaxy is incredibly large compared to us, and yet it's really only a very, very small portion of the observable universe. So here's uh, some images to give you a relative sense of scale for some of the things that uh, you might be interested in in the universe. Uh, this is series of images right up here for our solar system. So there's the Earth relative to what we call the terrestrial planets. Uh, Venus is pretty similar in size. And then the larger gas giant planets, uh, Jupiter, most people are familiar with, the largest planet in our solar system. And then uh, down here, Jupiter and the Sun. So as you can see, even Jupiter, which is quite large relative to the Earth, there's the Earth and Jupiter. The Sun is pretty big compared to the Earth. However, it turns out that the Sun is actually quite small on the cosmic scale of things, even compared to other stars. So if you go down the chart here, we just keep getting larger and larger and larger. Uh, the Sun is... Um, uh, so this is... Uh, I can't remember the name of the star now. <laughs> it appears there relative to Aldebaran. 
and some other stars which are far bigger than the sun. Okay, so if you haven't yet gotten the picture, it's going to get worse because all of these things here are little tiny dots in this picture there. So I'll throw around the word light year occasionally, and you may already know what that means. If not, it's the distance that light travels in one year. So it's a little bit strange. It's a time referencing a distance. Uh, we use this because light travels really fast, but not infinitely, and we're dealing with very, very large distances here. So the scale of the galaxy here is roughly 100,000 light years from edge to edge. It's not a hard boundary, it's kind of fuzzy, but that's a rough number. Okay, so our solar system is sort of off to one side on the galaxy. It's not right in the middle, it's not right on the edge, it's sort of halfway out. We zoom out. Now, all of these uh, points in here uh, roughly represent stars. But the points on this plot represent galaxies. So, our galaxy is right here in the middle, it's a little dot in a small group called the local group of galaxies. And then there's some clusters nearby, the biggest one is the Virgo cluster, and we're actually hurtling towards the Virgo cluster at a pretty high rate of speed. You can't notice it, obviously, but uh, astronomers have measured that, and we know that we're moving towards that collection just by the collective gravity of all of these galaxies pulling us inward. Uh, and there's some other clusters around here, and this is a series or a compilation of images with the various different kinds of galaxies that are out there. It turns out there's a lot of different kinds of galaxies. They have different shapes and sizes and whatnot. Uh, the nice spiral one, another up there, and then more of an elliptical galaxy, which is a little less uh, feature to it. So if we zoom out again, I should point out the size scales here. This is 10 million light years here. So we went from an object that's 100,000 up to many objects within a few millions or tens of millions of light years. So if we zoom out again, now the scale bar here is 100 million light years. And you can see that those points, which are individual galaxies, some of them still show up, but now we're starting to see clusters as smaller points. And those clusters group together into what we call super clusters. And it's uh, this large scale structure that cosmologists are interested in studying in order to understand how we got to where we are from where we were initially in the early universe. And I'm going to show you a video in a second, which is a compilation of data that's been acquired by several projects, in particular the Sloan Digital Sky Survey. And it's essentially a map of the universe as we know it today. And one thing to watch out for is there will be some gaps. Uh, those gaps are not real. There's uh, specific regions of the sky that have been mapped by this survey, and there's other regions that haven't been mapped. So this video is actually going to show you a realistic representation of what we know about the universe. And this is a this diagram here is a, a small chunk of that particular view. So let me just uh, show you that.
So that's our universe. And you might notice that this uh, looks like a sphere. Well, we're looking in from our perspective where we would be looking out. And so, of course, we see the universe as a sphere around us. That doesn't mean it actually is a sphere, but that's our perspective. And I hope I've convinced you by now that it is a very big place. Um, if you need any more reminder of this, uh, there's lots of resources online which you can look up and get a, maybe a better sense of scale. So, it's very big. And it turns out that it's also out to kill you. It's a very dangerous place to live. You may already know this, but uh, the world is a very unsafe place, and it's worse than you think. So one thing that I'm interested in doing is understanding a little bit the history of life on Earth. Now, that's not my specialty. I'm not a paleontologist. I'm trained as a physicist. But I work with paleontologists. And we ask questions like, is it possible that the history of life can be understood in part as an interaction with the outside universe in some way? And of course we know that there's some connection, right? We get energy from the sun, we need that. We know that our solar system formed uh, out of a solar nebula. We know that it was enriched by supernovae and so on. But life itself is relatively recent, and we want to understand if there's some connections there. So, this terrifying graph here shows the extinction rate of, and this is in families, so it's a, a group of organisms, families, per million years. So this is a, a long time period here. This is about uh, 500 million years or so down here total. And there's these big spikes, and that means lots of things died, lots of things died, lots of things died. And you may be familiar with one of these, if, even if you don't know the term, the Cretaceous Tertiary references the end of the dinosaurs, or at least what most people uh, would term the end point of the dinosaurs. And we generally understand that as an impact. So whether it's comet or asteroid, I think most people would agree that it's a, an asteroid, something a little denser and heavier. But whatever it happened to have been, it left a big hole in the Yucatan Peninsula and a layer of iridium, this uh, rare element, which can be traced to asteroids. And these guys don't exist anymore. So this is a geologic time scale, and I showed you on that last slide that ended right about here, and I can see my pointer turning on batteries. Uh, so that slide ended here. It turns out the history of Earth is much longer than that. So the end of the dinosaurs is right about here. Now, I have a colleague at the University of Kansas who's a paleontologist, and he studies trilobites. And that's these little guys down here. And this one's going to be eaten by a cephalopod. So he won't be killed by a cosmic event, but maybe his bites will be. Uh, if you go back far enough, the origin of really complex life is somewhere around here. And a few hundred million years later, at the end of the Ordovician, there's one of the first major mass extinctions. So most of the trilobite species died out at this time, and most of the other things that were around at the time also died. And what's interesting about this is there's no clear reason for this extinction. So the dinosaurs, yeah, we, we pretty much know that there was something big from space hit the Earth, and most things died. Uh, the, some of these other extinctions are not very well understood. So. It's a place to add another possibility. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the comet asteroid issue, and then go on to some other uh, things that I've spent more of my professional time on. Uh, here's a couple of images, one of which is, again, an artist interpretation of the last thing the dinosaurs ever saw, essentially. And then over here, this is an actual picture from a region in uh, Siberia, called the Tunguska region. And this was, uh, it's thought to be an airburst event where a reasonably large object, but not nearly as big as the one on the right, entered the atmosphere and exploded uh, fairly close to the ground above this region in Siberia. Now, fortunately, almost no one lives there. Apparently, one person was killed by this event. Uh, but a whole lot of trees were flattened. This affected a pretty large area. Uh, and whether or not these kinds of things happen frequently is open to debate. So we can look at the geologic record, we can look for craters, and they're fairly easy to find if they're recent.
but over time, the Earth's surface changes, and it can change dramatically and even rapidly. So finding a good history of impact events can be very difficult. Uh, one can make estimates, and how often this might occur, it's really hard to say. So I've seen estimates of every few hundred million years or so, or maybe more frequently, or maybe less frequently. Of course, this is a random kind of event, so it's really hard to put down a you know, next Tuesday kind of estimate on it. Uh, the good thing about asteroids, of course, is generally we can see them coming with a fair amount of warning. Uh, here's an example of a, a fairly recent, reasonably close approach. And this asteroid was, was pretty good sized. And it came fairly close to us. Uh, but one thing to note is, again, space is a very, very big place. right? So I, I had some panicked phone calls and emails around this time from people in the community who were extremely worried that this was going at the Earth. And I, I had to try and reassure them that this was not the case. Uh, when I went out and looked at some of the resources that they were viewing on the web, it doesn't help when you see this kind of image over here. And you think, wow, that's a pretty big asteroid, and it's pretty close to the Earth. Um, this diagram is very much not to scale. So keep in mind that even though there's a lot of stuff floating around out there, space is extremely big. So the chances of getting hit are reasonably low. And we can see these kinds of events with pretty good warning. Doesn't mean we'll catch everything, but yeah, there are actually observation programs that look specifically for near-Earth objects like this one. So uh, a couple of decades from now, we expect that this uh, asteroid will pass pretty close to the Earth. Now, one of the things that's interesting is over time, the trajectory can change a little bit just due to interactions, and we can generally predict that pretty well, but there's a certain amount of uncertainty. As time goes by, we'll get less uncertain, we'll know more precisely what will happen to make better predictions. But this should be pretty spectacular. We should be able to actually see this, and um, it'll be a good show. Hopefully it's not too good of a show. All right, so that's the big rocks from space part of the talk. What I'm more interested in is things that are possibly a bit more rare, although solar events are, are not that infrequent, but could be even more devastating. And not in the sense that something slams into the Earth, but can have long-term effects mainly due to changes in our atmosphere. So I'm going to start with solar events, and I'll tell you a little bit about how they work and then some of the consequences. And then I'm going to talk about a category of astrophysical events, which are much more rare and much more distant, but also much, much, much more powerful. So I've got some numbers here, and when you get up to these size scales, it doesn't really matter what units you use, so I chose megatons because that sounds scary. So uh, if you think about nuclear weapons, that's a, a number that's used for uh, those kinds of explosions, and again, these numbers get so large that even that reference scale may not mean much to you. But what you can see is that there's a lot of energy involved here. So I'm going to start out with looking at solar events. Now, it turns out that there's lots of different kinds of events that you can look at on the sun. So I've labeled this solar flares, but uh, more precisely, there are what are called coronal mass ejections, which are sometimes associated with flares and sometimes not, and it's complicated. But in any case, the sun produces these bursts of radiation. And it may be mostly in light. We can see these, visible light. The largest one ever observed was observed in uh, 1859 by a gentleman observing the sun with a solar telescope. He said, wow, the sun just got really, really bright. What happened? Well, it was a solar flare. Associated with that solar flare was an ejection of plasma from the sun, a coronal mass ejection, which happened to hit the Earth. We have to be in the right place at the right time, the wrong place at the wrong time, depending on your perspective. And if that happens, we can have what's called a geomagnetic storm, where the Earth's magnetic field interacts with the magnetic field of the plasma that's being carried through the uh, interplanetary medium. And this can have pretty interesting effects. So one of the things that they saw at the time was uh, effects on the telegraph system. So this was before widespread electricity use, but there was telegraph wires all over the place. And these long lines, basically just long cables, were, have induced currents. So if you take the Earth's magnetic field and you squeeze it and shake it around a bunch, it will induce currents in electric lines, especially ones that are very long. 
So there were actually fires started by this in telegraph offices because of parking. And some of the telegraph operators apparently were able to send messages without any power source. They, they said they were using cosmic electricity, which I guess sounded cool at the time. Um, the problem is we now have a very complex power grid and lots and lots of long distance transmission lines. And so a geomagnetic storm today would not quite be quite so entertaining. In fact, could be quite devastating to our, our technological infrastructure. The good news is people know how to deal with this to some extent. So if we're paying attention, knowing one's coming and take the right steps, it won't be devastating. Uh, however, even in recent times, with a fairly significant event, but nothing near the 1859 flare, uh, this knocked out power for a, a good chunk of Canada for several hours. Okay, so source flares are, are certainly something that we can worry about, uh, but fortunately there's also something we can prevent the major effects from really impacting us. But I want to show you some more images because solar events are just really cool to look at. And there's been some excellent work done in uh, recent years uh, by solar physicists to take incredible pictures and understand how these events occur. However, they are very complicated, so we really need to know a lot more about them. Uh, again, this is a, the same image I showed you before. And the sun is very active. So this is a uh, little movie about a month's worth of solar activity. And you can see there's a sort of steady stream, we call that the solar wind. And then there's occasionally these extra blasts, chromal mass ejections. And so the sun is variable. It changes over very short time scales, hours, minutes days or very long time scales, there's a cycle of about 11 years. And there's longer cycles of 100 years or so, and probably even longer cycles than that, of modulation in solar activity. So one of the things that solar physicists try to understand is what causes that, can we predict it, and especially right now, can we predict when one of these major events is going to happen with some accuracy so we can do something about it. Unfortunately, it is very difficult. But new technology is really helping out. So the Solar Dynamics Observatory, uh, you can find a lot of their images and videos online, and they're really spectacular. And very high resolution photos and videos showing some of what the sun can do. Uh, this is one of the Solar Dynamics Observatory videos. So we're in a more active cycle of the sun right now, and the peak may be coming or may actually have already come. What's interesting is the up cycle we're in right now is actually fairly uh, uninteresting in a sense. It hasn't really been doing that much. That might seem good because uh, less events, less danger. However, a lot of people in the solar physics community believe that if there are fewer events, the ones we do have are more likely to be extremely energetic. It's sort of like you store up all that energy and then boom all at once instead of sort of trickling it out. So that could mean that we're in for potential uh, larger storms as time goes by. But again, it's complicated and hard to predict. So the sun is great, we need it, but it also can be uh, threatening to some extent. All right, so on to stars which are more threatening, but also farther away, fortunately. Uh, there's a class of stellar explosion we call supernova, and supernovae is the or all that, in case you're wondering. And there's two very general kinds of categories which I'll talk about, and actually I'll just sort of gloss over most of the details. But one of them involves the collapse of a massive star. So stars fuse in order to generate energy in their cores, and that holds up their bulk for a certain amount of time. But when they run out of energy to push outward and prevent gravity from pulling the star in, that uh, break that balance is lost. So the force of gravity pulls the star inward and some complicated stuff happens and then it explodes. So these are some of the brightest explosions that we can observe. And there's another class which is an interaction between a compact star called a white dwarf and a companion star and they happen in a similar way in terms of what we see. So they're basically big explosions where uh, an entity a star is actually destroyed. So it releases a huge amount of energy. And if you go back to compare the, uh, the energy scales here, we can get a lot of energy out of a, a flare on the sun, but it's really nothing compared to one of these explosions. So this is what a, 
is what a solar uh, supernova in the center of our galaxy might look like if we were to zoom in on that region. Very bright. And a lot of the material gets blasted out into the surrounding space. And you end up with what's uh, called a supernova remnant. And these are actually very pretty, a lot of them. Um, inside of that supernova remnant, there's a whole lot of hot gas. There's a whole lot of energy around. And so living inside one of these is probably a bad place to be. There's another category, exploding stars, called gamma ray bursts. And these are, to some extent, a special case of a supernova. So, there's what's called a long burst, that means it lasts for a reasonably long period of time, relatively long, seconds, tens of seconds. And this is another case of a core collapse, a massive star that runs out of fuel, collapses and explodes. But in this case, there's a jet of radiation along its rotation axis. And what that means is that a lot of the energy is concentrated, it's directed along this jet. And if you happen to be unlucky enough to be looking down the barrel of that uh, jet, then you're going to get this massive blast of radiation. These were actually discovered in the 1960s by satellites which had been launched to uh, monitor for the nuclear test ban treaty, which had been passed recently. Uh, people aren't supposed to be exploding nuclear weapons in the atmosphere. And the uh, VELA satellites, as they were called, began to observe these all over the place, about one per day. And people thought, well, that's strange because we know there aren't nuclear explosions going on on the Earth once every day. Uh, so they eventually tracked them to these kinds of stellar explosions. And this was uh, a big mystery in astrophysics for a long time, and to some extent still is, especially this other category, which are called short bursts. The current model is that they probably are a merger event, where there's two compact objects, uh, in this case uh, neutron stars, which are uh, extreme enough as it is, but when you combine them, they will produce this massive explosion that's very short-lived. So these are called short gamma ray bursts because they only last a fraction of a second. So these are blasts of radiation that are intense but very short. They're also relatively rare, so we don't see these uh, close by frequently. In fact, all of the gamma ray bursts that have ever been observed have been outside of our galaxy. That's probably a good thing. So we can think about how the Earth might be affected by these kinds of events. And gamma ray bursts and supernovae are kind of lumped together because they have similar effects. They both produce a lot of high energy light gamma rays, hence the name gamma ray burst. Uh, they may also produce what are called cosmic rays, which are charged particles, pieces of atoms, protons, things like that. And whatever the radiation might be, these two different kinds, they have similar effects on the Earth in terms of their effects on the atmosphere, which is what I primarily study. There are some other effects that we're beginning to investigate as well, but this is the, uh, the best understood area right now. So when you dump a bunch of radiation into the atmosphere, you might think, well, that's kind of scary. We're sitting here exposed and the gamma rays and will irradiate us and we'll all turn into Hulk. Turns out that's not the case, fortunately, because there's a big atmosphere above us. And X-rays and gamma rays are absorbed very strongly in the atmosphere. So they think, ah, good, we're safe, okay. Well, not exactly. Because when you put that energy in, it has to go somewhere. And the absorption process is breaking apart uh, molecules, ionizing atoms, which means knocking their electrons off. And then some chemistry occurs. And you end up producing some special compounds which destroy ozone and are catalysts. That means they destroy the ozone and they stay around themselves destroyed. So this is a problem. We know this is a problem because we have produced catalytic ozone destroyers called chlorofluorocarbons. And uh, a couple of decades ago, there was treaties passed to stop producing those because we observed that there was a major reduction in ozone over particularly the Antarctic region, although also the Arctic. So we know that this uh, catalytic kind of reaction can be very bad for ozone. And if you produce a lot of this in one of these events, it doesn't have to last very long. You can have a fraction of a second dump all that energy into the atmosphere, this chemistry happens, and it stays around for years, up to a decade or so. So what you end up with is, over a large fraction of the Earth, a greatly reduced ozone shield. So you look up in the sky and you see the sun, 
and you're getting a whole lot of ultraviolet light. So everybody knows that if you stand outside the sun too long, you get sunburned, you might get skin cancer over a long enough period of time. Now imagine turning that way up. This is going to be particularly significant for uh, animals and plants that are outside all the time. Uh, green plants have to be in the sun to eat, essentially, so they're going to be especially impacted. Uh, one of the interesting side effects of this is the nitrogen oxides that are produced, so these catalytic compounds that are produced, are actually kind of brown. If you take a vial full of this stuff and put it in the light, it looks brown. It's basically smog. So another effect here is you actually can get a dark sky while simultaneously having more ultraviolet light from the sun. And this is a nice graphic that Astronomy Magazine put together first a couple of years ago, and it shows sort of what happens to the atmosphere. So normally you have a nice protective ozone layer, ultraviolet light from the sun is mostly absorbed, and we don't get much of that at the surface. Uh, you blow something up nearby, put a lot of energy into the atmosphere, and these nitrogen oxides are produced, destroy the ozone, and the solar ultraviolet comes through, and you get this kind of background smoggy haze. And over time, this will recover. So once the energy is turned off and the chemistry is stopped, these nitrogen oxides will be accumulated into water vapor, and they'll be uh, eventually precipitated out. So you actually get some nitric acid rain out of this as well. It turns out it's really not that bad. Uh, a student and I wrote a paper on this a couple of years ago, and we were a little disappointed when it turned out it really wouldn't affect anything all that significantly. So over time, this will recover, and it takes maybe a decade or so for the uh, ozone layer to recover by this process of just removing the nitrates from the atmosphere. So we wanted to look at what the subsequent effects would be. And the primary work that has been done is looking at the ozone depletion, because we know that's going to be bad. Clearly there's going to be negative effects, but how bad will it be? And what kinds of effects can we expect? Well, as I said, you can get sunburns, you can get skin cancer, things like that. But we wanted to expand that beyond just what we know about our own uh, particular impacts because we're interested in a wider kind of ecological effect. So if we want to understand, say, mass extinctions in the Earth's history, we want to consider more than just the impacts on humans. Uh, this is a picture of a whale with lesions from sunburn. So I ran across this paper a few years ago and I uh, thought, wow, that's, that's really interesting because I'd never thought of whales getting sunburns. So it turns out that there's a lot of life on Earth which is negatively affected. Uh, over here is some uh, plankton, phytoplankton. They live in the ocean, and you can see they're green. They've got chloroplasts. They uh, photosynthesize, so they use the sunlight to produce food, and they're exposed to the UV. So one of the simplest things that can happen is UV light breaks apart bonds in DNA, and also proteins and other sorts of uh, cellular structures are important. So we decided that we would look at the DNA damage that might be caused by solar UV under this depleted ozone layer. And we put together a little animation of this. So we take our ozone depletion estimates and we combine that with what people have measured for the impact on DNA, <coughs> DNA damage, and we put together this little movie that depicts that. So the red here indicates a lot of damage, and the event happens there. And you can see the little ticker here, this is days. And over time, this will uh, cover a pretty big portion of the globe. And you'll see it coming back and forth, that's with the seasons. So if the sun is up, you can get sunburn. If it's not, you can't. And over the uh, hemisphere where there's no sunlight, of course, there's no DNA damage. So this will cycle back and forth. One thing that's interesting, which you may have noticed, is uh, up here in the sort of mid-latitudes where we live, it's pretty much always red. So there's a problem uh, if you live in these kinds of mid-latitudes or toward the equator. So putting all of this together gives us a little bit better picture of how these kinds of events may have occurred. Uh, we want to get a little more precise because organisms aren't bare DNA. We aren't just hanging around with DNA strands on our skin. And, getting killed. Uh, so I've collaborated with a photobiologist at the Smithsonian to measure uh, what are called weighting functions, to really measure in a lab 
how UV light affects certain phytoplankton species, especially those that live near us. Now, why did we pick these? Well, one thing, they're easy to put in the lab and experiment on. Um, they're pretty easy to grow, and you can do that without a whole lot of uh, difficulty. Another reason is that they form the base of the food chain. So, if you're interested in ecological impact, that is, how does this affect the wider food web, all the different species that might exist, a good place to start is the primary producers. So, if we're looking at the uh, main producers on Earth, those actually turn out to be marine phytoplankton. Right? We normally think of them grass and trees and crops and things like that. But in terms of total biodiversity and biomass, the phytoplankton are really the starting point. <clears throat> a side effect of that is that most, or at least half, <clears throat> of our oxygen comes from these kinds of primary producers. So they're pretty important. So we're looking at this in more detail now and trying to get a better handle on really, you know, how realistic is this kind of image? Is it really that bad or maybe not quite as bad as we thought? And then connecting that back to possible mass extinction. So here's some more of the travel lights. What we found, uh, well, I shouldn't say we, what my paleontologist colleagues have found by digging around in lots of rocks all over the world is some correlations. <coughs> and if you look at the kinds of organisms that lived at the time, and you determine where they lived on Earth and where they lived in the oceans, these are, uh, at this time, I should point out, Everything that was known to live was in the ocean. There wasn't any land life at this time, which seems a little strange, but apparently that's how it was. So there's some correlations. Uh, organisms that live pref preferentially at certain latitudes, turns out mid-latitudes, where we see our biggest effect, and those that live toward the surface of the water are more likely to be extinct after this line on the chart there. So this fits very nicely with our predictions, because if you live at the top of the water, there's nothing to protect you from the UV. And if you live at those mid-latitudes where the sun is generally fairly high and the ozone is depleted, then you're more likely to get irradiated by the solar UV. So unfortunately, this doesn't have a nice smoking gun like the uh, big hole in the Yucatan and an iridium layer. Uh, but we've convinced a fair number of geologists and paleontologists to at least pay attention to this as a, a possible effect. So whether or not this is uh, the real cause for this extinction is still certainly open to debate, um, but I think it's becoming more accepted, and it's something that more scientists are starting to think about, these kinds of cosmic uh, radiation events, as something to really take seriously in terms of the history of life. So what people always want to know is, you know, how soon is this going to happen to me, right? So 440 million years ago is a long time ago. And we've done some estimates of that. And it, uh, again, these things are random, so we can't just say you know, every 10 years it's going to occur. But we can do some statistics based on what we have measured, what we know the rates are. And it looks like uh, the supernova and these short gamma ray bursts, even though they're very short, they pack a big punch maybe every couple hundred million years or so, we can expect one of these. And then for the longer kind of gamma ray burst, we can expect a couple every billion years or so. So we're due, right? 440 million years ago, coming around again any day now. Of course, as I said, it's a random kind of event. Now people always ask, can we see these coming? Well, possibly. You can see the big kinds of stars which will produce a supernova. And we know that there aren't any close enough to us to produce a supernova which would be uh, significant in the near future. However, these guys here, these compact objects like neutron stars, are relatively difficult to see, even relatively close by. So, could be somewhere just around the bend in the galaxy, there's a pair of neutron stars getting ready to collide and explode and send a jet of radiation our way. We don't know. Statistically, of course, uh, we're not really likely to, to see one of these anytime soon, but it is a random kind of event, and we never know exactly. So, if there's one thing you should be worried about, it's probably the solar events. So, everybody go home and call up your power company and say, do you have a mitigation strategy for geomagnetic storms? And if they don't, then 
call them the next week and ask them again. All right. So um, going forward in time, we have essentially a guarantee that the Earth will be wiped out at some point. Right? Whether it's an asteroid, no, an asteroid won't wipe out the Earth, but it'll probably wipe out us. Uh, eventually, the sun is going to do us in because over a very long period of time, very slowly, the sun is getting brighter and hotter uh, from our perspective. So eventually, the Earth's ocean will boil off, will be uninhabitable. Maybe we can move to Europa. I'm looking for beachside property in Europa right now. I hear it's cheap. Uh, I don't know if we'll be around to take advantage of it, but I give it a try. So eventually, the Earth is going to be uninhabitable. And of course, it's going to be a long time, but you know, it's, I think this motivates looking out and up and trying to uh, keep our presence in space alive for the future. Even though this is a very long way off, I think it's, it's wise for us to be continuing to look out and continue to reach away from this planet where we live. So finally, I often also get asked, you know, should I be worried about this? And some people genuinely are worried about it. Uh, I'm not. I have spent a lot of my time thinking about these things, and I'm not that worried about it. Why not? Well, because it's not very likely to happen to you. Um, of course, you know, you're not very likely to get hit by a tornado either, but it happens. <laughs> uh, I, I like this statistic that uh, you're more likely to get killed by a shark than one of these events. Um, of course, there's a problem with that, right? If you've never been to the ocean, then you have zero chance. But statistically speaking, over the population, uh, you're much more likely to be killed by something much more mundane. So if you're scared, just relax. All right. That's what I wanted to say. And if you have any questions, please let me know. I want to acknowledge a lot of collaborators, and especially my students who have worked on this, uh, these projects over the years. And um, generous support from NASA that's been extremely well used. Thank you. Any questions? certain species are more resilient than others, and it turns out some of the species we're looking at here appear to be pretty hardy in terms of UV. Um, so there's probably some connection to whether or not certain organisms are used to dealing with this kind of radiation, because a lot of organisms have repair mechanisms, and they can actually go along and fix those kinds of DNA strand breaks or whatever it happens to be. Um, so things get complicated when we start talking about individual organisms, but there, there does seem to be you know, some more able to handle, handle it than others. Can you use that then to determine, looking at the survivors, what kind of an event caused the... To some extent. Um, I mentioned the, the correlations that we saw at that extinction, and that, that fits with our predictions. However, it's not exclusive. There are other things you can think of which might you know, explain those correlations as well. Um, in terms of uh, resilience and DNA repair mechanisms and things like that, that's a much more difficult thing to get, say, from the fossil record. Uh, so no one's really attempted to do that yet. Yes, sir. During large coronal mass ejection, how much um, time would the world have to prepare? <laughs> well, uh, the transit time is, is uh, at minimum hours, more like uh, a couple of days maybe. And the, the real problem though is uh, there's not a simple one-to-one -one correlation. So uh, there has to be a lot of things that go right or go wrong, depending on your perspective, in order for a coronal mass ejection to severely impact the Earth. So it has to be in the right place on the sun. There's a particular latitude, uh, longitude, where that happens and, and in order to affect the Earth. Uh, it has to be the right energy. 
has to carry the right particle density load, it has to have the right magnetic field strength and direction, and so on and so on and so on. So the good news is uh, it's fairly rare for something like that to really happen. The bad news is we don't really know whether a certain event is going to have an impact on the Earth until it's quite close. So we have uh, pretty much one satellite in the right place in order to observe the uh, properties of the material that's coming in and actually tell us you know, whether there's a significant threat. And on that time scale, it's, it's hours or less in terms of you know, saying, yes, this is definitely going to be a threatening event. There's a big industry out there trying to make better predictions, and it's hard to do. It's really complicated. Yeah. Uh, two things. That first, that last question. I always imagine those as traveling at the speed of light so that we would have no warning, but that is not oh, okay. true, I think. Um, no. So when a flare happens and we see the light from it, you're right that it travels at the speed of light, which isn't instantaneous, though. The sun's about eight minutes away in terms of light. Mm -hmm. um, but the coronal mass ejection is moving at sub-light speeds because basically it's a big chunk of the sun. Uh, not big relative to the sun, but <laughs> big relative to the Earth. So it's uh, it's protons, uh, electrons, that are moving at sub-light speeds. Pretty fast, but still uh, slower than light. Um, in the slide about the, the sky mapping, mm -hmm. the, the, the first slide said, oh, half a million galaxies and 70,000 quasars or pulsars or... Oh, yeah, in the video, yeah, right. I wondered why they separated those. I always imagine whether it's a quasar or it's a pulsar, is it just a strange star inside a galaxy? Well, a quasar is an active galaxy. So um, it's a galaxy that has a supermassive black hole in the center, which is actively accreting matter. It's for feeding on surrounding matter. And that produces a, a large amount of radiation that we can see from a large distance. So they're, they're sort of a different category of galaxies. Um, they're actually probably very similar in most respects, but they happen to be active at the time we're observing. So that's the distinction. 